uh, who is the secretary of the Bletchley Park Trust, about the negotiation, politicking, and other maneuvering that is going on concerning the acquisition of Bletchley Park as a potential campus of museums. Uh, so far, uh, we have still not achieved success, uh, but the signs are still promising. I'm happy during the year to find that we have got resurrection back on the rails. It had slipped a little, and uh, but now we've had two issues in rapid succession, and our thanks are due particularly to Nick Mentick now for all he does on that one. It's been an important year for the Elliott 401. Uh, we had a reception to mark the four, its 40th anniversary, and also there is a project underway under Chris Burton to restore the Elliott 401, which we have in the engine shed around the back. The last thing I would say is that it's been pleasing to begin during the year to form a group in Manchester uh, who will work there on machines, and in particular uh, on a Pegasus, another Pegasus, but it isn't just another Pegasus, it is Pegasus number one, uh, which was in Portland Place for a long time. Uh, and therefore, around that, we hope to develop the work of a group in Manchester. I think that's all I need say. Uh, I think from those relatively few words, you can see that it's been a very busy year, and I think a very successful year. And I'd like to thank all of you uh, who have played a part, and in particular, of course, the chairman or leaders of our working parties. Uh, a number have been in office for some time. Uh, during the year, uh, I've been particularly conscious of the work which Harold Geary has done on our archives, uh, which is a, a, mon a mammoth task, uh, and a lot of work has already been done and significant achievement made. That's the end of my report. I wonder if our treasurer would like to say anything. Yeah, um, well, or even if he wouldn't, yeah. would he? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I think everyone who hasn't had one before has actually got a copy of the account. Um, basically, it's fairly straightforward, except for the fact that um, during this year, the Science Museum um, started to pay out-of-pocket expenses for work on their inventory items um, to our members. So, um, you, you see that there's quite a lot of money going out on the various um, working parties and an amount of that is coming back in income under the heading science museum this is just really administratively easier for members of the conservation society to fill out BCS expense claims and then we rebill it to the science museum on a monthly basis um, hopefully I hope people will agree keeps the turnaround time on expenses down to a minimum um, that, that, that's about it. We're fairly light on costs for resurrection. Um, this will be heavier next year, so we're <laughs> looking to that to explain. And the spare comma in, miscellaneous is a, in the miscellaneous figure is a typing error. It is £406. That's just, you're maybe not able to type straight on that. Um, that's about it. The three items at the bottom are one outstanding corporate subscription, a recharge to the Science Museum, and, as I said in the notes, a, a donation which we would like to make to the Bletchley Park Trust, but haven't yet discovered a way of doing it within the constitution of the BCS as a charity. Um, we're still thinking about that. So, that's, that's it. Any questions? Thanks for our stand. May I invite our secretary to take the next item, or to begin the next item? Um, well, now we come to um, election of, of chairman. Um, I have had no nominations for chairman. Fair um, is it fair to stand again? Uh, Let anybody propose him? Ian? Do I second that? Uh, George? Okay. Any other nominations? All those in favour? Thank you. Thank you very much.
very much. You have on your agenda a list of officers. Uh, the committee itself consists of some elected members and some ex officio members, uh, i.e. the chairman of our working parties and one or two other appointments. Uh, they are there ex officio. Uh, it is a fact that all of our officers, the secretary, the treasurer, and the other committee members have expressed their willingness to continue to serve. Uh, there have been no other nominations. Uh, and unless someone here and now wishes to make a further nomination, does anyone wish to make a nomination? I think, therefore, it would be reasonable for me to say that they're all declared re-elected uh, with thanks for all they have done in the past and hopes for the future. Uh, we have to elect a correctly spelt auditor. Uh, perhaps the treasurer would like to propose. Well, I, will I think this is all a bit dodgy if I do something like that. I mean, I'm sure it should be somebody from a neutral corner who would so. propose. I, 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 I have been asked if I'd really like to do it again after all the arduous here this afternoon. Are you prepared to do the end, Frank? We have to do a Yes. <laughs> That's a supposition on which we all work. Uh, proposed by Robin, seconded by Chris. By Chris. All in favour? Fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I'm okay to stop right. <laughs> and with that, we complete the agenda for the AGM. Thank you all very much. Yeah, Gosh, that took a long time. Ten minutes. <laughs> that, was, that was very slow. Yeah. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the chairman has asked me to introduce the, the speaker, um, Robin. We have uh, Robin Shirley uh, tonight, and he is going to give us um, the S100 bus story part two, I think was said, <laughs> something like that. Um, anyway, Robin, over to you. Well, no microphone, the speaker. Um, in this theatre a little over a year ago, as uh, Tony just said, I gave a talk called Altair and After on the industrial and social history of the personal microcomputer movement and how it led to the ubiquitous PCs that we use today. In many ways, what I have to say tonight is indeed a continuation of that theme, going back to the early years and concentrating on the hardware story as we examine how the open definition of the Altair's 100-way bus led to a glorious explosion of interchangeable hardware from many different vendors, which in its way set the tone of the PC movement almost as much as did the standard operating software environment provided by CPM. And the consequences of these events are, of course, very much still with us. Uh, there are a few copies of my first talk here at the front, in case you missed it. And there's also an abridged version in Resurrection 5, or is it 4? And I hope that those who heard it previously will bear with me when I revisit the parts that are central to our subject tonight. By the way, whenever I refer to PCs, meaning personal computers, it's important to remember that when it was coined around 1974-75, this term didn't mean IBM PCs, which weren't to appear on the scene for a further six years. Although, whenever we need to take a long view, it should be taken to include them. And so also, from a user's point of view, should one include less freely expandable machines, such as TRS-80s and Apple's, although these have less to do with our purposes tonight, since they adopted various different, and in the long run, less successful architectures that didn't have an open bus with uncommitted motherboard slots. IBM took the term, the name PC, from the pre-existing, mainly S100-based personal computer movement and went on to make it seem its own by virtue of marketing muscle and manufacturing volume. However, the translation is indeed historically appropriate, since in most respects the IBM PC and its clones and developments are the direct lineal successors of those original 8-bit personal computers, 
and as I argued in my previous talk, that was indeed one of the main reasons for their success. But to begin at the beginning, we must go back to the Altair and to MITS. In late 1974, a series of computer construction articles on a rudimentary Intel 8008-based Mark 8 microcomputer appeared in Radio Electronics magazine. This was the first time a computer had been put within the reach of anyone but a large company, and it aroused enormous interest. Not wanting to be outdone, Les Solomon, the editor of Popular Electronics, therefore a trade rival, commissioned Ed Roberts, the president of a small company called MITS in Albuquerque, New Mexico, to come up with a similar computer kit. Roberts decided to base it on Intel's new 8080A chip, and the Altair 8800 was born. Reputedly, the name Altair was suggested by Solomon's 12-year-old daughter after the Enterprise's destination in the episode of Star Trek she'd just been watching. Roberts, being a sci-fi fan, liked it too. The first Altair article appeared in the January 75 issue of Popular Electronics. It had a bus based on a 100-way edge connector on which MITS had got a good surplus deal and was accordingly called the Altair Bus. And here is something I couldn't show you last time, that is actually an Altair bus from an Altair. Uh, a little bit further down the line, I think, than the first one, but it didn't change really in any important particular. Notice that it is just that, a row of edge connectors, card guides, and you can't really see here, but there are 100 lines going down there. It's a purely basic passive bus. Unlike, for example, the bus in the Apple II, which has electronics on the motherboard, and, uh, and the slots are pre-addressed. This is not the case in the Altair, just as it is not the case in the IBM PC. This is tremendously important for expandability. It means that a card need know nothing about which slot it's going into. All slots are equivalent. The resulting incidental but lavish availability of 100 bus lines led to the provision of a very rich environment of status and control signals, which was in turn to prove a spur to the designers for third party and imports. Ed Roberts, the owner and chief executive of MITS, comes across at first sight as a somewhat unusual person to start an industrial revolution, though perhaps not in a deeper sense since an unusual person is presumably just what's needed. Seattle journalists James Wallace and Jim Erickson in their book Hard Drive, chronicling the rise of Bill Gates and Microsoft, describe Ed Roberts as a hulking bear of a man. And he was certainly both physically big, six foot four and 21 stone, and had a forceful and often overbearing manner. It's reported that only the hyperactive 19-year-old Gates, slightly built but with the confidence of his money background, refused to back down to him, and they had ferocious rounds. He also had enormous energy and a powerful appetite for new knowledge, new ideas, and new activities. Looking at his role in the S100 and PC story, an equally important side to his character was his position as someone who, although within the electronic engineering industry, was so in a sense more as an amateur than as a professional. His real ambition was to go to medical school and become a country doctor. And as it says there, uh, and indeed that was exactly what he was to do nearly three years later in 1977, when he sold his business out in its entirety to Pertec, a large corporation, uh, and that is what we're seeing here is, in fact, second generation Altair equipment. This side here, this, this part, was actually, well, it says here, it was in fact made by Pertec. It was after the, the, uh, the takeover. Over here, you see this chamaturi sort of lettering here. This is original 1975 mitts. I'll come back to that. His company mitts had begun as a genuine garage operation. It did actually start operation from Robert's garage. 
in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when he left the US Air Force. Initially, he sold mail order model rocket equipment and transmitters for radio controlled model planes. And indeed, the initials MITS originally stood for Model Instrumentation and Telemetry Systems. Model would get changed later to micro in the sort of retrospective promotion that often happened in the early industry, as for example with CPM, Gary Kildall's ubiquitous 8080 disk operating system, known by its initials behind which its, behind which its original name was quietly updated to something more impressive. Since my first talk, the Society and Science Musician Museum have had the good fortune, as you see, to be donated some audio equipment from, uh, from and by Longfield School in Kent, where it was in use until relatively recently. And some of it is on the bench in front of you. We'll have a look at it later. Here we have an 8800B main chassis. The B shows that it's from the later era, after the Perte fire. But the prize exhibit, as I've said, is this. An original mixed floppy disk unit from 1975 or 76. All the Altair drives, and indeed some of the other equipment as well, the hard disk controller, for example, were always mounted in separate external cabinets. If you look inside, and I won't tip it up so that you can, because the floppy drive will fall out, it's not screwed in. Uh, that's not down to mix, it's just that uh, we temporarily put that in. What strikes you is the way it's been put together by basic prototyping methods, such as slotted angle strips with no hint of modern production engineering technology. A huge contrast with its polished successors of only three years later. This flavor of clumsy cut and try manufacture seems to pervade all the early MITS production. Nevertheless, it's hard to overestimate its significance. Looking back at the original MITS Altair, it's important to realize not only how strikingly crude it was, but also in a way how crude it could afford to be, or even needed to be, if it was to catch its moment, almost as an embryo needs to start from a single cell. It's often said by my father, for one, who was first a sculptor and later an aircraft designer, both pretty exacting professions, that if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing well. But this was not at all the right problem for the infant personal computer industry. Who were better advised to say that if a thing was worth doing, it was worth doing fast, it was worth doing immediately, and worth doing cheaply. This is well illustrated by contrasting the Altair with another class of microcomputer, which, though far more professionally constructed than the Altair and actually available earlier, was not to be on the evolutionary branch that led to the modern DC. These were the microprocessor development systems, made by corporations like Intel and Motorola, well-designed, solidly built, on the bulky side, and intended mainly for engineering development work, but at prices that were over 10 times that of the basic Altair kit, which MITS originally advertised, this is beginning of 1975, at $397. This astonishingly low price was only possible because Ed Roberts had succeeded in browbeating Intel into selling him 8080 chips in volume for $75 each instead of the regular price of $350. The sort of enterprise that was to be crucial to the success of the Altair and its bus design, and hence to the launch of the personal computer movement. Unlike the big corporations, Ed Roberts knew exactly the way that hobbyists' minds worked. OK, and I reduced that. Yeah, where the light's coming from, actually. Uh, anyway, I brought that along, not because it's anything directly to do with S100 computers, bus computers, but because it does illustrate, I think, rather nicely the way that, say, hobbyist minds work. This is the hobbyist as hero. This is fantasy land. <laughs> It's all being controlled by an Intel 8048 single board computer down there in the middle, if you can see it. Uh, everything, the telephone, the train, and they're truly amazed and, and worshipful.
And this, for contrast, is uh, it's a little bit later again because it's 8800B like this one. This is a UK ad. This was uh, from a firm called Compelec, uh, outstanding for its incompetence, which uh, they were, in my, as far as I know, the only people who had a concession to import small American microcomputers into the UK in around about 1966, 67, 68, who didn't immediately become millionaires. And if I tell you the price, you'll get an evening why. Uh, this is, ad is October 1978, and the price of that machine, and uh, incidentally those who, this is a, that, that view shows very nicely a feature that we'll see. If you know what a, what a, a Nova looks like, a general Nova, it looks pretty much like that. Um, the price here of that machine, which has got 56K, so quite a lot of memory in this day, two floppy drives and a VDU, the price of that is £5,952. Compolet didn't find very many purchases at those prices, and uh, they, they fairly soon departed from the market. Its internals may have been crude, but to the average hobbyist, the great thing about the Altair was that it seemed attainable whereas an Intel MDS was as far out of reach as a PDP-11 or a Data General Nova, which, as I say, the Altair rather resembled externally. That was important too. It looked like a proper computer, although at that stage it looks were rather deceptive. In 1974, with MIT's near bankruptcy, Roberts had bet the company on the Altair project, securing a $65,000 development loan by convincing his bankers that he could sell several hundred of the machines. He had underestimated the irresistible magic of the idea of owning one's own computer. Within a few weeks of that magazine coming out, over 4,000 prepaid orders had poured in, and MITS leapt from some $300,000 in the red to nearly as much in the black. The personal computer, a name coined by Roberts and advertising the Altair, had arrived. And this is a little bit further along. This is from the first West Coast Computer Fair. Uh, it's published in Byte in July 77. But this gives an idea of that excitement. Those are the throngs of people, 1977, around the, the stands of this uh, sort of semi-professional, semi-amateur computer fair. The original Altair was essentially a prototype and had many shortcomings from a feeble power supply to somewhat flaky bus time. And it was replaced in due course by a revised production version, the 8800B, which was somewhat better. And this, as I said, the one you see there. A number of improved clones started to appear. Uh, that's a, that's a, a MITS ad uh, showing the 8800B, uh, a montage of boards um, some of which actually existed. Um, a number of improved clones started to appear, so that by August 76, Dr. Dobbs' Journal of Computer Calisthenics and Orthodontics, uh, making them dance and straightening their teeth, was calling its 100-way bus the Altair Imsi, or Hobbyist Standard Bus. Roger Mellon, of the then small company Cromimco, proposed the name Standard 100 Bus. S100 for short, because it had 100 lines. And this was the name that stuck. In due course, some five years later, a cleaned up 8-16-bit version was to become officially standardized as the IEEE 696 bus. The S100 bus had most of the faults and virtues of unplanned industry standards. It had been designed in a hurry, wasn't optimized against crosstalk, and lent rather too much on the peculiarities of a particular processor, the 8080. On the other hand, it could be made to work reliably and was good enough. It quickly became the de facto standard. The S100 bus mirrored the architecture of early microprocessors, firstly in that it contained an 8-bit data bus. Actually, given the abundance of lines available, it had separate input and output data buses. Well, 
I tried to highlight this in, uh, in, in color, but it hasn't come out that well. But you see, the green, I've marked the, the green lines here, like these, they're, they're the data in, uh, the red are the data out. And the yellow, which don't really come out too well, are the address plus lines. And later, by multiplexing, it made it quite easy to provide an extension loop to a 16-bit data bus. It also had a 16-bit address bus. And from the professional standpoint of electronic design engineers, who tend to be minimalists, an unnecessarily rich collection of status and control lines and clock signals. Another important, and I think prudent choice by MITS, which at the time reflected their need to get something workable out of the door quickly, despite their lack of experience with computer systems, was their design decision to distribute unregulated rather than regulated power. Thus, the S100 bus provides most of the voltages likely to be needed by chips in the form of unregulated DC rails of nominally 8 volts and plus or minus 16 volts. By unregulated, I mean full wave rectified and smoothed by a single electrolytic filter capacitor, a huge 180,000 microvolt, microfarad affair, the size of a baked bean can, in the case of the main 8 plus 8 volt power rail, which could deliver getting on for 30 amps in some machines, enough for light welding. A side effect of the presence of this size of filter capacitor is that enough charge is stored to let the system ride out mains dropout shorter than about half a second. I've often seen a horizon or similar machine sail blindly through a dropout that momentarily dims the room lights, while modern PCAT clones in the room reboot or hang. A side effect of the presence of this size of filter capacitor, <coughs> yes, uh, mm -hmm. recycling a paragraph here. Since bus line 13 provides a power failure warning signal, which is guaranteed to give at least 50 milliseconds for action before the voltage rails go out of spec, it's also possible to implement a form of power fail auto restart on S100 systems, or at least a controlled shutdown. The unregulated power rails might retain one or two volts of AC ripple, so they're not suitable for feeding directly to ICs. Hence it was left to each car to be responsible for providing its own onboard regulation for the voltages it's need needed. Typically, with basic fixed voltage regulator chips like 7805s, 79L05s, 78L12s and 79L12s, which if you're not familiar with those numbers, the 78s are the pluses and the 79s are the minuses and the Ls are the little ones where you don't have to give very much power. Giving plus or minus 5 volts and plus or minus 12 volts respectively. These work simply and effectively, though inefficiently, dumping the excessive heat, but we're on the mains, there's plenty of power around. Generally, with a smallish tantalum capacitor in parallel, which, if the design margins were cut too fine, would blow safely but alarmingly on occasion, like an exotic fuse, producing a brief but impressive cloud of acrid smoke. This probably wouldn't have seemed the most natural scheme to a professional circuit designer, who tend to regulate power centrally with more sophisticated switching mode circuits, as in the IBM PC. But it had desirable characteristics for machines that were to be used and upgraded by many different people in a great variety of environments. The chief benefit of onboard regulation was the way it made mixed vendor systems more docile by stopping interference from propagating from board to board along the power rails. It also helped to get working the relatively long buses with many slots, 18 on the Altair bus that I showed you, 21 on the Kremenko Z2, needed because of the limited functionality of the early boards. For example, for example only 4K on each mixed memory board so that a lot of boards could be needed in one system. It was these 4K memory boards in particular that were to prove a source of contention and encourage other manufacturers to challenge the MITS monopoly. The basic $397 Altair kit didn't include any input output other than the front panel display and switches, and also only 256, that's not K, but bytes of RAM, and of course no software. This was just enough for a hobbyist to get the thrill of entering a program via the front panel switches and seeing his own handiwork come to life and display a test panel on the LEDs. He was lucky. But to do any useful work, more was needed, especially more memory, preferably enough to run a high-level language. 
This was where Bill Gates and his partner Paul Allen came in with what was to become Microsoft Basic, developed semi-clandestinely using an 8080 simulator on the PDP-10 at Harvard, where Bates was then a second-year student. Allen joined MIT as a software director in spring 75, and Gates a few months later, dropping out of his studies to the dismay of his mother, although Gates remained a freelance and was never formally a MIT's employee. By the early summer of 75, the first 4K paper tape version of Microsoft Basic was shipping, made practical by the ready availability of government surface AR33, ASR33 teletypes, soon followed by an 8K version, then an extended basic requiring 12K to 16K of RAM. Programmers have never had any difficulty overflowing the available memory. At this time, the uh, development machine at MITS had 7K. From MITS point of view, the purpose of Microsoft Basic, which they marketed as Altair Basic, was to sell hardware principally memory boards, and their contract with Microsoft was drawn up with that in mind. Now, as I expect you know, dynamic RAM, DRAM chips store data as charges in tightly packed rows of capacitors, which have to be refreshed every few milliseconds before they leak away, whereas static RAM, SRAM, uses transistorized flip-flop switches that need more power and space per bit, but are simple to implement. At any given time, DRAM always offers more bits per chip and per dollar than SRAM, but with less speed and more problems. Unfortunately, the early DRAM chips had particularly finicky timing and voltage constraints and were difficult to design for, so much so that a number of memory board manufacturers, notably Bill Godbout, were to hold out for years against DRAM, sticking to the more expensive but more forgiving SRAM. And that's uh, an early Godbout uh, ad. By this time, I don't have the date for this. Already, I think, remaindering, that is, that's a 4K Godbout Coloran board. That's effectively $100. This was about the last time you could get 4K boards, so it must have been something like 1976. Admits, however, Ed Roberts predictably picked the low-cost DRAM option, but found that he could not more than he could chew. The MITS 4K DRAM boards were poorly designed and seldom worked as advertised. Meanwhile, other companies started to ship their own RAM boards, which did work. However, in order to get hold of Altair Basic, people were having to buy the near-useless MITS memory boards. Even then, they weren't getting the copies of Basic that they'd ordered and paid for, because of shipping delays at MIPS due to memory board problems. How this led to the first piracy of personal computer software and the split up of Microsoft from MIPS is a fascinating story that you can read in hard drive but will take us too far from our brief here. The time window in which MIPS could successfully exploit their vision in creating the personal computer market, despite their technical shortcomings, was to be a relatively brief one. A California company called IMS Associates, Inc., hence IMSI, looked at the Altair and decided they could do better. So in late 75, the first Altair-compatible machine appeared, the IMSI 8080. As I said, the Altair, with its front panel of metal toggle switches and LEDs, looked like a proper computer, specifically a data general Nova. The IMSI 8080 went one further, with a row of colored plastic clip switches that looked just like a PDP-11. I understand we've just been offered an Insight 8080. I've heard on the way walking across here. The overall quality of the Insight was also much higher, so that here at last was the basis of a reasonably reliable small business microcomputer system. It was soon followed by the handsome but expensive processor technology Sol with its smart blue livery, built in keyboard and low profile design. There's a, a Sol looking expensive. And that's showing the boards and all the various things you can add to it. Again, a little bit further down the road than when it was first introduced. It had horizontally mounted bus slots, and uh, the boards slid in. You couldn't get so many in as a Altair. And the polymorphic systems Poly88, which were described in my earlier talk. Again, 
you notice how the ambience is moving up market from the, the original conception. Floppy disk systems are appearing too. At first, single-sided, single-density, 8-inch drives holding a nominal 250k per diskette, and later the new 5 and a quarter inch Shugard SA400 mini floppy format, which you see there, which in single-sided, single-density form stored about 175k. Among the add-on disk system vendors was a California company called Northstar, whose products were bundled with a free but Spartan disk operating system and an excellent BCD-based basic interpreter, and whose blue-painted drive cabinet soon became a common sight in the UK as well, they were imported by, by Interact and Pimlico. They also made a hardware floating point designed around uh, the 74 LS181 4-bit ALU. And here is one, and that was also supported by versions of Millstar Basic. Hardware floating point implemented entirely in TTL 7400 series logic. A very, very ingenious chief designer at, uh, at one store. Just as would occur a decade later with the add-on PC board makers, Northstar was soon to use this experience as a springboard into producing complete systems. The period 76-77 saw the arrival of a host of high-quality second-generation designs based on the 4 megahertz Zilog Z80A, which ushered in the golden age of S100 systems. As the personal computer movement gained in confidence and maturity, it was realized that hand switches were no longer necessary, and the new systems instead jumped on reset to a bootstrap ROM on either the CPU board or the disk controller, which then booted up the operating system from a floppy disk. There followed a host of classic designs on this pattern, such as the Kremenko Z2, the North Star Horizon, a lot of horizons in the UK, it's the most widely used machine. Well, that's a bit of a dim slide, but that is a horizon spread out in bits and kit form on somebody's kitchen table. Mine, <laughs> and that's me soldering together a North, a North Star ZBB. It's the processor board. Here is one. You see there the Z80. Whoa, very big chip, 40 pins. By 1979, although in terms of market share and value, personal microcomputers made up a cloud on the horizon no bigger than a man's hand, scorned by the mainframe constituency, few of whom had heard it at all, in some respects the future was already fixed. Anyone who stood back at that time and studied the evolutionary ecology, as it were, of computers, as I did, could see at once that in the long run, microcomputers were bound to replace both the traditional mainframe and mini-computer architectures. It was simply a matter of their evolution rate and generation times. Whereas it took perhaps seven to 10 years to produce a new generation of mainframes, and some three to five years for minis, microcomputers evolved at a simply phenomenal rate. Initially at better than a generation a year, leveling out at one to two years, they simply outbred their rivals. If we label the rough and ready Altair 8800 of early 75 as the first generation, and the more reliable and better engineered IMSI 8080, Sol, and perhaps Altair 8800B of 75 76 as second generation, then polished third generation Z80A based machines that already rivaled low end mini computers like the Z2 and the Horizon were already appearing by 1976 77. By extrapolating these graphs, driven as they were by the inexorable progress of Moore's law concerning the doubling time of IC circuit density, one could already predict a crossing point in the early 1990s when microcomputers would start to pull ahead of all other types, as has now happened, though of course often in disguise, like DEC Alpha Minis and parallel supercomputers. After considerable effort over several years, 
to the efforts of people like George Morrow of Finger Toys, the extension of the S100 bus definition to a new IEEE 696 standard, as I say, was achieved, producing an upwards compatible extension from an 8-bit to a 16-bit data bus, from a 16-bit to a 24-bit address bus, without requiring any changes in pin layout, or in most cases, to motherboard design. And here we see that there are address lines like uh, over here, A20, 21, 22, and 23. These are in the extended address bus. Enough, for example, for a Motorola 68000, which was as far as any chip went at that time. And the green and the red, the 8-bit data input bus and the 8-bit data output bus are now multiplexed together to form a single dual direction 16-bit data bus. The draft standard was published in July 79, and the final version approved in June 81. According to Sol Lives and Mark Garrix in their classic 1981 book, Interfacing to S100 IEEE 696 microcomputers, which is out of position. Oh no, that's the that's a complete that's a complete horizon board set. That the, the result of my soldering would be that. So got the processor board uh, at the top, we've got the disk controller, and in the middle, well, it, the result of my soldering wouldn't be that because that wasn't available at the time I was doing it. That's actually a, a 64k memory board, or more truthfully, it's a 32k memory board, Linux to be doubled to 64k. According to this book, which is 1981, there were then some 200,000 S100 systems in operation. It's interesting to bear this figure in mind. Considered enormous at the time, the heyday of S100, when looking at what was soon to follow. There were also reported to be nearly 100 different manufacturers offering about 400 different plug-in S100 boards. And amongst the things there is uh, some catalogues. And these are Vero producing S100 prototyping boards. Emphasizing the aim of processor independence for the IEEE 696 bus, Lives and Garrett's list eight different 8 bit CPU boards that were available for it 8080A, 8085, Z80A, 2650, 6502, 6800, 6802, and 6809. Though really the first three are just variants on the same architecture. They made up nearly all the total. They also listed some seven 16 bit CPU boards, which were 9900. Texas Instruments, LSI 11 like, not an actual LSI 11, 8086, 8088, which are really the same, Z8000, which for a long time was thought to be the successor to the Z80 but never caught on, 68000, and Pascal Microengine. <coughs> In general, upwards compatibility from earlier hardware was very good, though conflicts with the new standard inevitably arose for some of the early designs, where undefined lines in the original Autos specification had been used for proprietary purposes. In practice, this was relatively unimportant. Few such machines had been built, and they were unlikely to be upgraded with new processors, etc. Conflicts also arose in some later designs, which have tied to ground, for instance, for reasons of improved noise immunity, previously unused lines, which became defined in the new standard. An example was the North Star Horizon motherboard where the unused bus line 61 had been tied inaccessibly to ground beneath each 100-way edge connector. Unfortunately, when the IEEE 696 standard came along, this previously unimportant line became A20 in the extended 24-bit address bus, which meant that Horizons required significant modifications before they could be upgraded to new 16-bit processes. In practice, this too proved unimportant, since Horizons like most other machines, tended to carry on doing the tasks they'd been bought for, rather than get involved in major upgrades. A story with a moral for those today who pay extra for upgradable and, quotes, future-proof computers, where the lesson of the short but breakneck history 
of microcomputers is that no such animal has ever existed or is ever likely to. In fact, none of the 16 stroke 24 bit extensions, or indeed the IEEE 696 standard itself, were in the end very significant, because the whole episode proved to be another example of the sailing ship effect, which is to say, things get their maximum rate of development just as they're about to vanish. Since, by a classic piece of technological irony, IEEE 696 was finalized just as the whole thriving S100 bus scene was about to be overshadowed by the introduction of the IBM PC and its successors. A mere four years later, in 1985, with the coming of the PC-18, it was fading into irrelevance. The 200,000 S100 systems of 1981 had been overwhelmed by the millions of IBM PCs and clones. Incidentally, let me digress for a moment on a similar situation today, in which the history of the IEEE 696 story has repeated itself, also after some five or six years, in the case of a 32-bit EISA extension of the PC-80 bus, another sailing ship effect, which too is coming into widespread availability just as it's about to be superseded, first by the VL, that's Visa Local bus, and probably soon also by Intel's new 64-bit PCI, that's Peripheral Component Interconnect bus standards. Well, I propose to spend the time that remains looking at some examples of the numerous boards that were produced by various independent vendors for use with S100 systems, just to give a sense of the tremendous life and variety that there was at that time. Very lovely. Let's start with memory. Well, this is memory from the future a name that, that disappeared, was well thought of, but disappeared rather fast, Technical Design Labs. And here you see uh, it's a 16K board. And the price down here in kit form, $574. That's more than, more than the Horsehair ones. <coughs> and this is a sort of panorama of memory boards, S100 memory boards through the ages. Starting at the top, top left with a much loved Godfather Conoram 2 8K memory board with the 2102 static chips. On the right, industrial uh, microsystems 8K, the equivalent. Then we've got a, uh, the board that you saw earlier. It's a North Star 32K board that has been um, upgraded by the installation, you see top middle of that board there, uh, a little row, a little row of, uh, of diodes on a header, and if you, that's the underside on the right, you see that there's another set underneath there, and um, that was to let the uh, 32K board use 16-bit chips instead of 8-bit chips. 8-bit chips, by the way, were busted 16-bit chips. And you couldn't, couldn't ordinarily buy them. But Northstar could, and they designed the whole 32K memory board around them so that they were, what is it, four, eight different variants, depending whether it was in the top half or the bottom half, whether it was in the row or the column. Anyway, uh, that made it a 64K memory board. And down here we have North Star's professional 64K memory board, the HRAM. And over here, a British one from uh, HTE in Southampton. And down at the bottom, from integrated micro microproducts, I have a concept. This is uh, a, uh, that would be a one megabyte memory board. So this is right, this is right at the end of the sailing ship effect. That was made for 68,000 based Unix system. Well, the large cabinet there is a Moro 26 megabyte hard disk, which is, well, it's 
tall as my washing machine. <laughs> and at the front, for comparison, is a, a modern three and a half inch hard disk. I think that's a 40 megabyte one. It wouldn't make much difference. It, it could be a 500 megabyte one now. And it's actually sitting in a five and a quarter inch mounting frame. And that's the controller over on the left there. And that 26 meg unit is extremely fragile. If you moved it without having got inside and plugged in the, the shipping bolt to stop it from moving under the heads, and, and you moved it at all, you would kill it. A little further down the line, this is now a five and a quarter inch hard disk, and that's with the classic um, uh, XCOM and two board controller set, which was rather tricky to work with. That's actually um, that's an SA. 604, she got SA604, so it's a 5 megabyte Winchester. And um, the reason for that board being turned over there was that one of the vices of these, there are two, two chief vices. One is that the interface board, which is this one, you see it's got lots of little presets on it. That one is actually a later one, it hasn't got, it's only got three lots of presets, some of them had some more over there. And some of those had to be adjusted using a scope that could time to five nanoseconds. And over there is the other, the other board, the, the data board, which is the one underneath there, it's the solder side of it. You see that great big white ground strap? Well, white strap. Take it from me, it is a ground strap. And the reason for it is that it's to go from over there, because otherwise the ground trace starts in that bottom right hand corner, goes all the way around the periphery to the ground edge connector pin in the bottom left corner there. Now that is long enough to make a tuned circuit. So if things were a little bit off, it would oscillate. So you might have oscillations of plus or minus three volts going on. And that ground strap is there to, to quench it. It, uh, it cost me 50 pounds of consultancy to discover that uh, you need to put, to put that on. Here's another similar story, more ground straps. Uh, this is the, well, the early, the early uh, S100 machines, of course, didn't have any high current regulated power of the kind that hard disks need. So that is a regulator board. It's an S100 board. It's picking up unregulated power from the bus. And it's got some rather beefy regulators there. And that dark area that you can't see so well in the shadow, they're just massive heat sinks. And on the solar side, that's where these come through. And the purpose of those straps is because the design, which is again HTP at Southampton, didn't provide any continuity for the ground except through the screws that held on the, uh, the heat sinks. And so, of course, with thermal creep, these were open and closed. So those, those uh, ground straps have been added on. And uh, and the joke is that isn't actually an HTE board. It's an interim clone of the HTE board, and they copied it in every detail uh, down to the error in the uh, continuity of the ground. Here's another, now, here's a little cluster of display boards. This, again, is very expensive at the time. It's called a screen splitter board. In fact, the whole outfit was a uh, screen splitter. Uh, very expensive. I think they really cost couple of thousand to get them. And they were memory map display boards. Often you know, memory map display boards. Looking, of course, to the future, because further designs, um, the IBM PC in particular, would be based on memory map displays. The Altair and its, and, and, and its contemporaries were not. You had to have an external VDU. And that gave well, a respectable resolution. I think it was 44 lines and 85 characters. This one again is from HGE, 
or high-tech electronics, they call themselves then. They later retracted to just the initials. And this is a color VDU board. Specifically, it's a Presto board. So that you could have your own Presto systems in this other machine and, and this in. And this is rather nice. It's a, a Matrox. Matrox is one of the supply hardware survivors. They're now producing high-performance accelerator boards with PCs. And that's the Alt-256 Star-Star Star Star 2, in other words, 256-bit square, bitmap graphics board. And down at the bottom is uh, the manual of some software from Sublogic, who actually wrote the Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's not Microsoft at all, it's Sublogic, who was then patched by Microsoft. So they're survivors as well. Well, here's a collection of sort of inter interesting, what you might call engineering specials. This is, this is a front panel on a board. So the idea was that you, you stuck that in the front of your machine and that you had the little keyboard on the right. You also had um, some uh, alphanumeric LED displays and it would give you an act like the, the front panel switches and display on the, on the altar. You could see the step and do things like that. Well, that's an exhibit we actually have there on the right hand end of the bench. This is a greatly elaborated um, Mullen extender board to which I've added switches that intercept each of the hundred uh, lines. And on the right, I'm not showing anything, but those are uh, he uh, LED hex display units fairly expensive Texas instrument ones. And I can also interrupt the various power levels. And you could put a troublesome board on the top of that, and you could find out why it was killing the rest of the machine. One, one bus line at a time. That's the other side, showing some of the, there's a lot of wire wrap, as you see at the top there, feeding the displays. And of course, another row of switches, because the other 50 lines were on this side. And that is one of the very prototyping boards put to use, faked in this particular case, but you see I've mounted a couple of prototyping strips on it, and just for illustrative purposes, they don't make up an actual circuit, for those of you who can recognize such things. Uh, that shows how you would, you would prototype something on a standard board using that. Uh, the kind of thing that people would do, I'm sure I was not the only person who did. Uh, and of course, you could develop equipment uh, in an OEM sense. A lot of these machines, they were, they were all built to a 19-inch rack mount, form factor, except for eccentric side of the sole. And you could control instruments, and many of them are still running today. I, I know a number that are, the University of Surrey, and I'm sure many elsewhere. So here, we've got a byte saver. That can program 1K byte EPROMs, and over there on the right is an Ithaca Audio 16K PROM board that can then take the PROMs and go in, and you can have a ROM driven, a ROM -driven piece of equipment uh, controlled by an S100 machine. A cup and an A to this. Here are a couple of mounting hardware real time clock boards. And some Exotica. Uh, let's see, there's. Um, I think that's a, a music board at the top. Yes, it's a music board at the top. It's a Hayes modem. Hayes, another survivor. The original Hayes modem in the middle. And uh, an IEEE 488 equipment control bus board at the bottom. And, and here, a pair of ads. I haven't got the actual boards. On the left, a CompuTalker. You sent data to it, and it would, it, you sent text to it, and it would speak the text after a fashion. On the right, Heuristic Labs Speech Lab kit. See? There's a microphone there. There's the board. You can input as well. All things that I observe are coming out now on the PC. They were available in a rudimentary form 
what are we talking about here? Probably about 1980. This, in a way, is, is the kind of culture that was extinguished by the IBM PC, which was much less rich and varied, and still is. Uh, whereas you could you could very easily go out and buy, for example, D to A boards quite cheaply for the S100 bus, which were the same price as a disc controller. Well, if you if you if you want a disc controller for a PC, which is a, a commodity mass market device, what is it now? It's about ten quid. If you want to buy a D to A board, which is not a mass market device, how much is it? Well, about five hundred quid. More expensive, in fact, than it would have been on S100. And now, uh, back to the sailing ship effect, what you're seeing there is a suite of boards for the, uh, the integrated microproducts in 68,000 system. That's enough to implement, and with, with a hard disk, enough to implement a Unix system on In fact, it's come from a Unix system. At the top, there's a uh, a SCSI host controller board. Below it is an eight port input output, serial input output port for terminals. And there is the uh, one megabyte RAM board that you saw earlier at the bottom is uh, a 68,000 CPU board. And uh, in fact, there's a companion board, which is a, uh, a memory, a memory um, uh, controller board. And Xenix would in fact run very happily in that, and it was perfectly possible to run eight or more terminals from it. In fact, in, in its factory, I think, it had about 32 terminals running from these. And that's that's the same that's the same board set actually inside you. It's an Amstrad 68K, which acts as a sort of acts as a sort of neutral host chassis. Sort of 60 meg tape streamer. Now, this is a reasonably respectable system. This is dated, we're looking here about 1986-87. Well, the other route to that was networking, having multiple processor boards. This pair of boards from HTE were the basis of the Minstrel, a British Horizon clone, and that was enough now to provide all the logic of the horizon. So we've got the um, processor, Input output memory, if you see top left there, four 64K chips giving you 64, 64K of memory, and everything on that. It's a horizon on a board, as it were, plus an HTE disco, which is a horizon disk controller clone. And here are a couple of slave processor boards. Again, uh, this HTE, the spam. Uh, slave processor and memory, and they've got Z80Bs running at 6 megahertz, and you have rows of these, you run ARC, you run TurboDOS operating system, link cabinets together with ARCnet if you needed to, and you could have dozens, 20 or 30, I, I saw about 30 users, um, each with their own processor, at the, the launch of the Minstrel 2, you know, I suppose about, about 1987. brings us to the end of the story. I hope I've succeeded in illustrating the theme of my talk, the principle of mix and match hardware that was introduced by the open architecture of the original Altair bus. It became a standard that set the tone for the personal computer movement and in other forms still continues with us today. Thank you. Surfaces coming into contact. There's quite strong springs here. These you come and have a look. These are all, all gold plated. These are also gold plated here. And um, if there ever was a suggestion of some trouble, and I only came across it once or twice in, in dirty 
employee environments, all you had to do was run and do a few rubber across there. And it was good, good for another, another five years. So very, very contractive. One of the problems that I encountered with the SRM bus system, much to my chagrin, was that um, some not very well uh, engineered versions, you can actually move it half a pin <laughs> apart. And I was once that uh, is demonstrating in an exhibition and changed the board and blew a whole chassis uh, <laughs> yes. all the open, all the, uh, for the back processor. Absolutely, and, and the reason we can find here, um, one, of, one of the bad bits of design, uh, if, you, if you go looking here, I mean, look, look, at, look at where these power rails are clustered together here. Yeah. They're yeah. opposite sides. You've got plus 8 volts next to plus 16 volts, <laughs> minus 8 volts next to minus 16 volts. I suppose we can at least say that you haven't got minus 16 next to plus 16. <laughs> but believe me, you had that 30 amp capacity without even pushing itself on some of them on the plus 8. And if you contacted that, contacted that with a plus 16, you had very a very interesting current flowing. And in fact, what it would do, it would evaporate off the gold edge connector, which was a, a tricky repair problem after this. <laughs> when did you start, Robin, with this? Um, in, well, in fact, my personal history is in these here, so in a bit more, more detail, you can find it there. But in, I guess, 1976, 77, and I went into S100 because I didn't have enough money to uh, buy a stupid uh, Intel microcomputer, microprocessor development system like our rich engineering departments did. And, uh, and I also didn't have enough money at that stage or couldn't raise enough money in, in the department to get the Southwest Technical Systems 6800 based um, micros that were coming in through computer workshop. Uh, they were really being imported a little before the S100 machines were being imported into the UK. So I spent a year reading the American magazines like Byte and um, Killabode and Dr. Dobbs. And so in, in, in 1978, was it 77, 78, I was sufficiently confident to, to order a Z2 in constructed form from Comart and a second Z2 in kit form. And uh, the idea being that with the kit, with the, with, the, with the good one as a model, we could we'd be able to build the one in kit form, and that was just about true. Except we couldn't afford memory, so uh, for, you know, from 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 Emco memory, which was expensive. So we got uh, from Peter Norman Computer Centre Fleet, which was again a garage operation. It was his garage fleet. Uh, he constructed, got about um, 8K Conoram 2 boards from Kit and sold them when we bought. We were really, went into the big time, we had 32K in each machine. We got four, uh, no, we got eight, eight, 30, eight, eight, 8K memory boards constructed. And we couldn't find which of them worked and which of them didn't because I suppose if we'd been sufficiently systematic, we'd have, we'd have been able to pin down there were some good ones in the batch. I think there were two good ones and six bad ones. And um, uh, a friend of I, uh, Bob Sonner, who was an American oil executive um, living down the road at uh, Byfield, um, had an IMSI 8080, and I went over to his place, and we tested the 8K memory boards and, uh, uh, and, and found out what the problem was. And it sort of went on from there. And I found myself, as a lot of people did, sort of sucked into being a professional. I, 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 I'm, by origin, a software person. It but started as a hobby, did it? Or? It started as an enthu yeah, really, it started as an enthusiasm. Uh, I, the first systems I didn't pay for myself, the university paid for, but I did them with the masterminding. And, um, and then, well, you saw me building that horizon. That was with a legacy in, I think it was Christmas 1979. I had an 800 pound legacy and I went out and blew it all. And I horizon one kit of interim. And, uh, and it went from there. And uh, then I started maintaining horizons. And then by the time the 68,000 episode came along, 
I, I had got myself painted into a corner. I actually became for a while the computer manufacturer. I soon happily got out of that and spoiled my hair for that. But today, do you use a PC? Today I use, yeah, today, I, today I've got a 486 DX266, which is exactly as powerful as the relatively new university Hewlett Packard mainframe. If you can log into the mainframe as a single user, which you can at about 2 a.m. on a back holiday, it then has exactly the same processing power as the 486DX266 for my number crunching work. But I've still got, I've still got um, Horizons working. I use it as a satellite printer station to the 486. And um, they're on the go. I hire them out to students to word process their, their theses with. I mean, word processing hasn't actually advanced since WordStar 3 or WordStar 4. It's branched out into species of desktop publishing, but as word processing, that was the plateau. There really wasn't anything better you could be. It was, from then on, it was limited by the human at the keyboard. Um, well, we know, uh, thanks, Rich. Do memory was something I came across on oh, yes. in, the, in the sort of late 70s. And this was a rather elegant way of uh, for those of you who don't know, we've got 64K of uh, address space, and you have 32K in which the system sits permanently, and then the upper 32, you have this back switch yes. concept. Well, it doesn't have to be 32 and 32. No, but uh, that's the one way to do it. Where, where, where did that sort of grow from? Well, it grew from the realization that 64K wasn't, after all, an infinite amount of memory. And uh, I mean, when, when you're getting 4K memory boards, you know, paying $500 or something for them, yes, 64K was a lot of memory. Surely nobody would ever want more than that. Just as uh, six or seven years down the line, nobody surely would ever want more than 640K of memory. Um, but they did. And what happened was, well, you see, in the unextended memory bus, you've got. 16 address lines, so you can address 64K. But of course, you've also got the 8-bit data bus. And what bank switching did was it used the 8-bit data bus, which in Intel processors is a sort of separate and not quite equal address space, because um, you can use it for ports. There's the port address space, so called. It's, it's a parallel, uh, it, it's, it's a it's a, it's a whole other address space that you get Intel processors. And this was used to distinguish between memory boards by which bank they were in. So you'd give a port instruction which would switch them in and switch them out. So you could have multiple memory boards occupying the same address space, one at a time, very analogous to the frame window in expanded memory in a, in a PC where you've got expanded memory, consists of a whole load of chunks of, logically, a whole load of chunks of whatever it is, 32K or 64K or whatever, that really sits sideways at the address space. And at any given time, one of them is switched in and the others are inactive. And, and that's how it was. And I didn't, I didn't bring it because I showed it last time, but there's a beautiful um, Insi ad, because Insi, um, were fairly early in the bank switching, I'm very proud of it. One of the things you could easily do with bank switching, of course, is you can do a sudden, complete swap of environments, like a, an interrupt service routine, where you can swap out one environment, swap in another. With bank switching, you can swap out 32K, 48K, all in one go. And this showed a single inside 8080, as you saw in the, the slide earlier. And as in, as in a hall of mirrors, there was a receding line of people sitting at PDUs on each side. And, and it was, they, they, they called it the, 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 the megabyte micro, or whatever. And the idea was that all of these would be on different memory boards, and multi-processing, being bank switched in and out. Of course, they couldn't really be, because you didn't have that many slots in, in, in the inside APAs. And if you had, the performance that you have got out of a single 2 megahertz 8080A chip servicing all these people is, is possibly quite limited. But uh, that's, that's how it went. And there were a number of operating systems that used bank switching, some of them, some of them really very successfully.
case, I worked with the, with the Apple Micro system, which was a clone on the uh, DDP. Sort of, yes, sort of. Um, the Alpha Micro was a very strange beast. It was, it was sort of, it, fit, it, it, it fitted in an S100 chassis, and it was designed by people who supported the S100 movement. But in pretty, pretty much every other respect, it was a movement. Do I remember that Variety had its penalty as a user? And um, say, around about 1980, there were an awful lot of um, disk operating systems with mutually incompatible disks. And it was very difficult to move a disk from one machine to another. And when we moved on to the PC, that sort of problem went away to an extent. That's right. Um, the S100 and, well, there was one main operating system, which was CPM. Logically, one main operating system, CPM. Physically, however, it was implemented, it, CPM was designed so that the same programs, and this could be, or it will be, the topic of, a, of, a, of another talk in a series, it deserves to be. But CPM let the, the um, typically the twin floppy, 48 or 64K, 8080 or Z80 micro, be a standard with a VDU, be a standard environment for software. And a program that was written to run under CPM would essentially, unless it used some exotic hardware feature of some particular machine, would essentially run on any machine that ran CPM. As long as you could physically transfer it from one machine to the other. And in many ways, the easiest way to do that is by piping it over a serial line, which is, in fact, what Pat and I do when we transfer the, the transcribed texts of our, of our talks here. I go over to this house and he's got a, a CPM system, and he's, um, I don't bother to try and read his, his disks. We simply pipe it over a, over a serial line to, to um, in my case, in the nest as well. But it would not be any two machines like that. The trouble was the environment was reasonably standard. The operating system was standard. It just had a, a, a BIOS that, as PCs did, it took, took it, um, into account the difference between particular instances of the hardware. But what there was not, um, and this is a shame, but it's not too surprising, given the way things grew up. In fact, given the way things grew up, it's, a, it's astounding that there was as much standardization as there was. But the trouble was that except for one or two kind of universal lingua franca, like 18 single-sided, single-density disks, they were patterned on an IBM format, and they were always the same. I, I, I know of no instances where, where, where they were not the same format, mutually readable. Not the double density ones, there wasn't complete standardization on the eight inch double density ones. On the five and a quarter inch ones, well, you would have a great many different formats. And I've got a program, Zena copy, there are other ones like that, that runs on an IBM PC. And it lists, I think, about 200 different CPM disk formats that it supports. And there are a whole lot more. It doesn't support, including all the ones I actually want to read on it. <laughs> It doesn't seem to read the soft sector format of PATS five and quarter inch disks. And it certainly doesn't read a, a horizon one, which is a hard sector format, no soft sector controls can read that. So yes, there was there was that problem. It came fairly close to being a standard environment, but there, there that that introduces some important issues for people who want to preserve software well like Doran's left now, but talking about the preservation of software, the kind of software that's, that is crucially vulnerable are the actual boot disks for the operating system. Because they epitomize the hardware dependence. And if they are lost, well, the, the system becomes very difficult to get by. You'd have to, re, you'd have to do the, recapitulate the original porting, as it were, of the CPM operating system onto the hardware, not a job that people um, want to toss off in a hurry. But once they're on a CPM, the logical format, 
the CPM is the same. Mm -hmm. and, and files on the CPM can be faithfully mapped without any loss of information onto MS-DOS uh, or onto Unix, onto, onto many different environments. So once, you're, you're, you, once you've left the physical format and you've gone into the logical domain, then suddenly everything is interchangeable. to a close there. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. And uh, I don't know whether uh, any of you wish to come down to the uh, Italian place for a quick, quick bite to eat. Uh, we'll move down there and uh, you know, something. So thank you very much again, Robin. Thank you. We've got a car to start back to the, uh, uh, the old canteen because this place is not secure now. Um, so we have a short break.